Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. The St. Louis Science Center began as a planetarium in 1963. Its unique hyperboloid shape is clearly visible from Interstate 64 to all who pass on uh, the southeast corner of Forest Park. In 1991, the Science Museum was built and connected to the planetarium via pedestrian bridge over the interstate. That year, it was the most visited science center in the world. In 2007, the complex hosted 1.2 million visitors with another 200,000 served through off-site programs at schools and community centers. Our guest today is Bill Kelly. Mr. Kelly is a senior educator at the Science Center James S. McDonald Planetarium, and he's been on staff there at the Science Center since 1991. Mr. Kelly holds a Master's of Education and has been involved in the science education for the past 18 years. Today we'll be talking about events at the Science Center, Pluto and the New Horizons mission, and Kepler 452b, a newly discovered planet which may have Earth-like qualities. Bill Kelly, welcome to Conversation. Thank you. Nice to talk with you today. I'm glad that you could come and talk about the Science Center. This, uh, there's a lot that goes on at the Science Center, isn't there? I uh, mean, it's not just a planetarium. It's not just a bunch of uh, 700 different exhibits. There's a bunch that oh, more than that. We've got a lot going on. Uh, we're really visited right now by a lot of uh, our Science Center campers. We've got a Science Summer Blast that we do every summer, and there's a lot of kids that come. And we've also got a lot of other visitors from all over the world, really. Well, that pause come right there. Uh, tell us about this science camp. Uh, I, I read about that a little bit. It sounded yeah. really cool. Well, we, we, we start that every uh, about June, and uh, we have different camps throughout the summer. Uh, some relate to uh, robotics, uh, robot camp, and there's a science fiction camp and all kinds of fun things Who can come on. to those? Uh, it, it's open to the public. They just have to, to register for the program. And is there a fee for this? There is a fee. Uh, I don't recall the exact yeah. uh, fee for that. They can look but, that but up. But they can look it up on our yeah. website, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can just go to the site. If you just Google St. Louis yeah. Science Center, you'll get right to the website. Yeah. And there's a lot of information there, which I learned a lot about just in preparation for the show. Yeah. So you guys have the, the science camp, and then you have, uh, there's like, Movie movie nights? Oh, yes. Yeah, we have um, First Fridays, and actually there's one coming up. You mentioned Pluto. There's a Pluto-themed First Friday on August 7th, and we're going to have a lot of activities, demonstrations related to uh, Pluto and what's going on with the New Horizons mission. Uh, we're hoping, and I think we're going to have, Dr. William McKinnon, who is going to uh, is a uh, co-investigator of the uh, New Horizons mission. Yeah, he's a Washington University professor, isn't he? That is correct. So right, St. Louis is intimately connected with this uh, Pluto project. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. yeah well, that's, that'll be a very interesting thing for uh, young people and, I guess, adults that's to, true. Uh, to come and listen to the guy who is one of the uh, principal investigators. Yes, yeah. It, it should be pretty exciting. And he was on a press conference the other day with... Uh, NASA television and was revealing some of the inf interesting information about Pluto that they're learning. Yeah. We also have, uh, if people are interested in space, there's an Alien Worlds and Androids exhibit we've got going on right yeah, now. Describe well. that. that. That seemed pretty interesting. It's kind of a neat uh, combination of both science fiction and science fact. So they take a look at some of the science fiction movies. They've got Robbie the Robot on display, at least a replica of him, and the Lost in Space robot. Plus, they also look at some of the real science that's being done to, to look at other worlds out there. Kind of like the Kepler mission, which you had mm -hmm. mentioned in the uh, 452B discovery. Yeah, well, we'll get to that yeah. uh, in, in just a little bit. I want to just cover some of the things that are going on at the, at the sure. Science Center. And then you have, uh, I was surprised to see you have these um, flight simulator programs that yes. are available to the public to come in and, and practice or pretend to fly through the arch and 
Talk a little oh, bit about sure. that. Absolutely, yeah. So we have actual um, 360 simulators that I think it's $5 a session and you can actually feel like you're rolling with the airplane. But there's other another section of that area where we have, um, it's called Take the Controls and you have uh, a flight simulator session. Those are free and you can come in and see what it would be like to fly a Cessna. Uh, and as you said, not in anything you can do in reality, but uh, in yeah, our no, simulators, no, you can fly clear. through the arch. Nobody you know? <laughs> is allowed to fly through the arch. That's, right. <laughs> That's a no-no. The SCC will come and get you. Right. But yeah, but in our can, simulators, you, you can. You can in your imagination. That's right. Yeah, in our simulators, you sure can. Yeah, so you can have flight simulators, and then there's some dinosaur uh, segment there where you can learn about dinosaurs and yeah. and like build a tooth or something? I yes, there's uh, there's uh, dino dinners we have there. What's that? Uh, it's a program, again, where uh, people can come together, experience what a dinosaur might eat, and they uh, can create their own dinosaur tooth. So it's it's kind of a fun program that we have. Uh, there's We have, from the old days, when we were at Museum of Science and Natural History, we brought the statues out at Oakmill Park over to the planetarium, and so those statues of the dinosaurs are still there, are, are at our place now, and the mechanical dinosaurs are over uh, in the main building, and you can actually see a T-Rex kind of moving around, and we have a Triceratops there as well. So and kids are always fascinated. With oh yeah, like they love they love the T-Rex. I know I was. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. It's is is that just a boy thing or are girls really fascinated? Oh, I think all also? all kids, boys or girls, love those dinosaurs. They come up and that's one of the first things they come and look for. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. So um, and, and there's what 700 or 750 different exhibits in the. Uh, in the science building. Yes, and we're actually changing up our exhibits. Uh, they recently uh, updated our discovery room. So there are a lot of new changes in our discovery room. They've got a rocket that you can actually, kids can climb in and a little simulated mission control that they can talk to the rocket pilot. And a lot of fun activities, a shadow play theater in there as well. What's, what uh, is that? Basically, um, kids can go in behind a, a screen and you can create shadows, uh, so it's kind of a fun activity for kids to do. Mm -hmm. We also have um, a makerspace area now that just opened up, uh, which is kind of uh, a fun thing to do, and there are programs that you can uh, book to partake in, in the makerspace. We're also in the process of uh, creating our BEAM exhibit, uh, Bridging Earth and Mars, where on the one side of the Science Center you're going to be able to uh, send instructions to a rover on the planetarium side. So you can kind of simulate that uh, del time delay you would get that you get from the uh, sending the messages from the Earth to Mars. Just like the real rovers, like the Mars Exploration rovers do. Yeah, there's a, um, I don't know, it's like an eight minute delay or something like that? Or? It depends upon where Earth and Mars are in their orbit. It can go between, if we're really close, maybe eight minutes, and if we're far apart in our orbits to maybe 20 minute delay. Oh, that much? Yes. I didn't realize that it was... Well, it I just, guess, yeah, I guess if the Earth was on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other side of the sun, that, uh, you, you, yeah, you're talking some distance. There. Yeah, it, it, every, about every two years we get very close, what we, time we call opposition. We're close to Mars, so we get a chance uh, to communicating a little quicker because the time delay is, is less. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be interesting if and when we ever start sending um, these robots to places like Europa, which I know that there's a lot of eagerness to explore because they, of certain reasons, which we can get into in a minute. But oh, yes. that'd be a really long delay, isn't it? Because Jupiter is, is very far. It's pretty far away. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head how ex exactly Many, many long. minutes. Many, yes. many light minutes to, it is. between here and there. Yeah. Definitely. So, so it's going to take, I mean, the, in essence, robots that go there are going to have to be artificially intelligent and be able to operate on their own, just given general instructions and sent there. Yes. Uh, that's kind of how the Mars robots operate. They are given directions um, 
they actually have hazard cameras on the bottom of the vehicle so that they can look and know what's a good way to go, what to avoid, because as we talked about with time delay, it takes time for that instruction to get there. And if we were trying to control it manually, if we're trying to avoid it, you know, driving into a, off a cliff or something, by the time the signal got there, the rover would have already crashed. So it's got yeah. somewhat yeah. <laughs> artificial intelligence already to know where to, to go and where to avoid. I think the ro one of the rovers got kind of stuck in a hole a little while, didn't it? It did, yeah. There was a rover named Spirit. It's one of the Mars exploration rovers. One of the little ones. Well, it's probably about the size of a golf cart, I would oh, say. Oh, that big. Yeah. Wow. That one's... Uh, a little larger than the small one, Pathfinder was maybe about the size of a small printer. But that one actually drove over what was probably a crater that was covered by kind of a sandy soil and it actually got stuck on a rock. Um, it, up until that point it had been driving on Mars for about six years. Uh, when it got stuck, they were not able to uh, complete a maneuver where typically during the winters they would drive the rover up kind of on a hill and angle it so that the solar panels would catch as much sunlight as possible because in the winters, just like us, the sunlight angle of the less. sun is less and so they're getting less sunlight. Since they weren't able to do that, they weren't able to keep the batteries going. So most probably they weren't able to keep the batteries going and the, uh, the electricity going to the heaters to keep their computers going. And, so sadly, we, Spirit's no longer in operation. But its twin opportunity still is driving today. It's going on a little after 10 years now. And some of these, some of these robots, some of these spaceships, are operating far, far beyond what we thought was going to be their useful life. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, the, both Spirit and Opportunity were only supposed to last about 90 days on Mars. And as I said, Spirit lasts years. about six <laughs> years, years later, and, and opportunity is going after ten. So, right. it's a pretty amazing thing. So yeah, the, and kids can learn more about this at the Science Center and the Planetarium. Yeah, and actually, I forgot to mention we have a movie called Journey to Space, um, which takes a look at past space flight and the possibility of future space flight, maybe sending humans to Mars one day. So. That's another nice way to explore space science and, and how uh, we humans are getting further out there into space, not only with our robots. So. Well, hopefully America will return to the manned space business. Not so much because we would learn so much more, but it is so much more exciting when human beings are involved in actually going there as opposed to robots going there. Sure. Although I saw that video of those guys that were watching when the first close-up signals of Pluto came in. They were like up and down and dancing, you know, they couldn't have been more excited. Oh yeah. We actually have a very interesting human space program going on right now on the station. We actually have an astronaut named Scott Kelly and he is spending a year in space. He has a twin brother named Mark. And this is a perfect experiment because they can study the effects of microgravity on the human body. He'll be up there for a year while his brother's still on the Earth and they can actually compare and see what happens and to the human body. And they're both astronauts, right? And they're both astronauts, right. yeah. That yeah, is so correct. They both have same physical training. That's correct. Well, that will be an interesting uh, experience. Uh, a year some people think, oh, that's a year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you look back, a year was short. <laughs> Living it day to day in, a, in the space station, while not, you know, tiny like, like an Apollo spacecraft, uh, is, is not that big. Yeah. Well, the current configuration of the station is, they say it's about the size of a football field. So... There is a lot of space, uh, a lot, a lot of space taken up by the station. But like you said, there's, you know, not as much room inside the compartments. Yeah, I mean, it's like spending a year indoors in a very large, maybe office space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's. It's a pretty exciting uh, experiment, and and they're doing a lot of great science on the station. Yeah, I I remember when they when they first started hauling the pieces up there that was the that was the main 
thing that the shuttle was supposed to do. Yes. Was to bring all the construction material up into space in order to construct the, uh, the space station. That's true, yeah. They, the shuttle brought up many components of the International Space Station. Yeah. So, all right, now, on to, on to Pluto. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, this, uh, we, we have this spaceship, which was, I guess, was called New Horizon? That's correct. Uh, yeah. Was uh, sent in 2006, was it? Yes, it launched in January of 2006. And what I think is so cool is that during launch, Pluto was still a planet. And along its way, um, come August of 2006, a group of astronomers came together, the International Astronomical Union. They had a vote and decided to call, with new criteria for a definition, decided that Pluto was no longer a planet, so it was demoted. So the mission actually went from going to a planet to a dwarf planet. Right. Well, some of us were sad, <laughs> you know, oh, poor Pluto. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> They took away its status. But now, though, they get there, and surprise, surprise, it's a very interesting uh, place, and it even has an atmosphere. Yeah, it's a very interesting world. Um, they have just posted some pictures uh, on NASA, their website. Uh, they, when they passed by on the closest uh, date was, I believe, July 14th. 14th, yes. They passed through the, the night side and was, looked back. They looked towards back. The sun, yeah. And you could actually see, see this ring. This ring around Pluto and it was there they were looking for the atmosphere. Yeah. And it was like eighty miles uh, in height, I believe. Yes. Which is unexpected. It was unexpected. And they found what they believe are two separate sections mm -hmm. in the atmosphere. I think one might be fifty miles high. So they're finding all kinds of new information about Pluto. Um, it's just fascinating. This world that has been so hidden from us for so long. I mean, in the well, early we've days. We've only known about it for 80 years. Though. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, that was, the, that was the last of the nine planets that was uh, discovered. I forget, what was the guy's name? So the gentleman who found Pluto his name was Clyde Tombaugh. Yes. And it's an amazing story how the man actually found it. They had a device called a blink comparator. And what they would do is they would take a picture of a portion of the sky, wait several days later, and take another picture. And if you imagine kind of like a, a slide projector, you put the two slides up. It's a device called a blink comparator. And you would basically slide this back and forth and look for any changes between those two slides. If they saw a star or an object that was in a different position. And that's how he found it. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. It's amazing Clyde Tom Tombaugh was able to find it in 1930. But he did. He noticed uh, this little star-like object in one portion of the sky, and then it was in a different portion of the sky in the next slide. So that's how they found Pluto. And he was really lucky in that he actually got to go to Pluto. Well, <laughs> I don't know if he actually got to go to Pluto, but... Well, the, the realities are, and it's a joke, but yeah, yeah. not so much a joke. Uh, he died, I forget what year he died in, but um, they, they have some of his ashes from his cremation, which is actually in the New Horizons uh, capsule that went out past Pluto, mm -hmm. as uh, I think per his family's request. Okay. I, I'm not familiar, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I thought that was that yeah. was kind of interesting. It's kind of like some of the Star Trek characters yeah. have had their uh, ashes uh, lifted into outer space I think as well. James Doohan, Scotty, yes, yeah, yeah, Scotty. Yeah. So, um, so you got, <coughs> excuse me. So you got this uh, this robot basically that's yes. out there. Now it's gone beyond Pluto, but it's going to be doing some other work too. That is true. Um, the mission scientists, now they basically want to get under their belt the exploration of Pluto. And then they're going to create a proposal to go on to the next Kuiper Belt object. That's actually part of the reason why Pluto was demoted. And they have to have three reasons or three criteria to be a planet. First, you have to have enough mass to form yourself into a sphere or ball. You have to go around the sun. Pluto meets both those criteria. Where it gets into trouble is you have to have enough mass to uh, push out other objects out of your way, not including your moon. So 
Because of this, Pluto actually orbits the solar system in a region they call the Kuiper Belt. And because it doesn't uh, push these other objects away, that's why the IAU demoted it to a dwarf planet. But back to your question, uh, the mission is going to go on and look at some of these Kuiper Belt objects. And I think they're going to have to, the team is going to have to decide what is feasible for the craft to get to at this stage. You know, what's the closest for Kuiper Belt object? Uh, what is the most interesting mission? What science objectives do they want to reach? Do they want to compare it to Pluto? Those kind of things. So I guess we'll hear more about that as soon as NASA and the scientists yeah, when decide. They make a decision what they want to do. Sure. And just so that people understand, the Kuiper Belt is kind of like, like we've seen the rings around Saturn, and um, this is kind of like the ring around uh, our solar system, isn't it? A good... Uh, it's like, Particles of ice and rock and... You're correct, yeah. It, it's And that's where comets come from. Yes. Sometimes gravity changes just enough to take one of these things and all of a sudden it starts heading in towards the sun. You're correct, yeah. So some of the um, objects out there are very comet-like bodies, frozen with metals and rocks and ices. And as you said, some can be drawn in and become long... Uh, period comets, uh, there's a good way to compare it. If you think of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, these uh, rocky ring of objects out there, uh, it's kind of a similar thing, only these are more icy objects. And what's interesting is that scientists believe these are the early remains of the solar system. So it's kind of like a time capsule. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the early ingredients of the solar system, which is a big important reason to go explore this area. Mm -hmm. Well, there, that's why they um, not that long ago landed a spaceship on a comet. Yes. That was a, that was a long format mission and uh, they landed on the comet and then unfortunately the lander wound up in some crack or something where sunlight was not available. That's right, yeah. So you run into different obstacles like that, and actually NASA and other space agencies are pretty good at trying to figure out little workarounds and, and figure out different techniques to try to get a little more use out of their robots. They get pretty attached to these things, kind of like their own children in a lot of ways. Um, we've had a lot of missions to comets, now that you mentioned, and we've actually had a impactor called Deep Impact crash right. into yes, a comet. Yes, I remember that. There's been uh, another mission called Stardust that actually flew to, into a tail of a comet mm -hmm. and collected particles and brought those particles back to the Earth in a little capsule. I think some of which are being actually studied here in St. Louis at Washington University. Mm -hmm. And of course you said it's, these comets are a time capsule going back to the earliest uh, um, formations of our solar system. So I suspect that some people are a little disappointed about this robot that landed in the wrong spot on that comet because it ran out of energy. It's got solar panels, so sure. it kind of ran out of energy and couldn't do all the experiments that they wanted. I know it did come back to life a little bit when the sun hit it, but who knows. Right. And then we'll go on to, um, what was it, Kep Kep uh, Kepler-452b. B. Yeah, we got about five minutes, so okay. let's, let's cover that. Sure. So the Kepler mission is a pretty interesting mission. Uh, it's a spacecraft that's basically in what we call an Earth trailing orbit. So it's chasing behind the Earth and it has to be out in space. Uh, they need to keep it from all atmospheric disruption. Mm -hmm. And it's got very sensitive uh, photometers, light detectors. Mm -hmm. And it basically works on a principle called the transit method. So you might be familiar with solar eclipses or maybe transits of Venus or Mercury. So basically in a solar eclipse, when the moon moves in front of the sun, the light of that sun will start to dim. And same thing happens with maybe the transit of Venus or Mercury. When those planets move in front of the sun, the light of the sun actually dims, but not as near Here on Earth, when we're looking, if you're looking at the sun and then Venus all of a sudden crosses the path, and it, then, it, then it dims just a little bit because Venus is blocking Part of the sun not noticeably to us much so more so with a lunar or a solar eclipse when the moon is moving in front probably there is a small fraction that is not detectable to us mm -hmm. that being said those type of uh, decreases is how they measure 
if a planet is there around another star. So they use the same technique called the transit. Mm -hmm. The Kepler has very sensitive light detectors on it. And up until I think it was 2013, just a couple of years ago, it was trained in an area of the Milky Way uh, near Cygnus the Swan, which is in the uh, Summer Triangle. And it was looking at that part of the Milky Way at over 100,000 stars. And it was capturing the light of these stars. And it was looking for each of those lights to dim. Now to find a planet, it doesn't have to dim. It shouldn't dim just once. They need to see it replicated several times. Those rotating around that sun. Exactly. And that way they can tell if a, a planet is there, if it's replicated. And of course they verify this with other telescopes. They have telescopes in Hawaii called the Keck telescopes. So they verify it through other uh, telescope means to make sure that their data is, is accurate. And, they're and what did they planet. find here? Well, with this planet, Kepler 452, they found a Earth-like planet. Uh, it's in what they call the Goldilocks zone. It's uh, orbiting, a, what's interesting is it's orbiting a G-class star, which is similar to our sun. That star is a little kind of bit- like a yellow- A yellow close star. Close to a yellow star. Yes. It's a little bit larger than our sun. The planet is what they call a super Earth. It's about 60% larger than our planet. So what's really exciting about this is it's, it's a, a planet. It's uh, similar to Earth. It's orbiting a yellow sun. And its orbit, I think, is about 385 Earth days, they calculated, that it takes to go around. So not too far from our 365 Earth day mm -hmm. time for us to go around the sun. So they're pretty, a lot of comparisons. And it's just about at the right place, what they call the habitable zone. Distant from the from Distance star. from the sun, yeah, that star, that there's a possibility for liquid water. And that's what they're really looking for. Now they haven't seen water. They haven't. They don't know water. Too far there. away. Too far away. But could be there. It's the right conditions for water to exist. Mm -hmm. Now, in reality, I mean, okay, let's just say this place exists. Maybe there's water there. Maybe there's amino acids that formed and create, you know, the the building blocks of life. Human beings, we ha we don't have the technology to ever go there. Or at least, what we have today. We're talking, it would take thousands and thousands of years at our current speeds to be yes. able to get there, wouldn't it? Yes. So we have chemical propulsion right now, and that's not going to get us very far. We need warp technology <laughs> if there is such a thing. Too we, many people think of Star Trek as reality. Sure, sure, right. Yeah, we, we don't have that technology to get that far and that fast uh, to these nearest stars. If you could travel at light speed, you know, it's 186,000 miles per second. I mean, some of these stars would still be too distant. The closest one to us is Alpha Centauri system. I guess we're just about out of time. Okay. We'll have to have you come back and we'll, it was very interesting. I'd like to talk more about the planetarium and some of the uh, things that you do there. Oh yeah, we do great shows there. So Thank you very much for coming and visiting with us today. Mm -hmm. And to uh, the audience, I've been speaking with uh, uh, Bill Kelly. He is a, uh, a representative from the St. Louis, what is it, the McDo uh, James, James S. 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 McDonald Planetarium. Planetarium and the, uh, the Science Museum. We're going to upload this to YouTube. Go there and take a look. Show this interview to your friends. We'll see you next time. Thank you.